what often happens with many founders is that this is the first time they're doing that job. You know, they founded a business in their 20s, 30s, 40s. They've not had C-suite experience. They've not built up a career in the traditional way. They've sort of leapt the level, started their own business. So they don't have that level of experience of managing people. You know, they just right. don't have that. So often the most well-rounded, robust founder-led businesses have a mixture of both people who are career experienced and experts versus founders who bring vision, energy, insight, intelligence, smarts, imagination that founders are known for. Welcome to You Belong in the C-Suite podcast. You are ambitious in life and in your career, but something is missing. You want to bring more of your passion to what you do, because let's be honest, you pour a ton into your work and it needs to mean more. I'm your host, Laura Eigel. I'm a mom, wife, PhD, coach, advocate, introvert, and indoor rowing fanatic. I'm passionate about living a life that's in line with my values. We'll give you the actionable tips and tools you need to lead with your values, make a difference, and have career success. The world needs more diversity and authenticity in the top jobs at organizations. Your leadership belongs there. You belong in the C-suite. Hi there, friends. My first book, Values First, How Knowing Your Core Beliefs Can Get You the Life and Career You Want, is now out in the world. Thank you so much for your support of the book. With your help, we are a number one Amazon bestseller in the business ethics category and a number one new release for time management in business and business etiquette. I have poured my heart into this book with personal stories and stories for my coaching clients using the values first framework. Between the constant pressure of job performance and demands on your time, it's easy to lose sight of your values, letting them shift out of alignment. Those simple misalignments are keeping you from feeling joyful and fulfilled. Learn how to recenter your life and career around what truly matters to you. Order values first now at your favorite independent bookstore, or at Barnes and Noble or Amazon. I wanna make sure that you are the first to know about every book activity that we have in store, including virtual and in-person events. Stay up to date by joining our list at thecatchgroup.com slash values first. That's thecatchgroup.com slash values first. Welcome to the You Belong in the C-Suite podcast. I'm excited to welcome this week's guest, Joe Leach. Joe is a trusted advisor and coach to CEOs of startups, high growth tech, and Fortune FTSE 100 companies. A recovering neuroscientist, then a spell as an elementary school teacher, from UX research to design to product management, then to product and business strategy, Joe brings 15 years in tech, 20 billion in revenue, experience with 30 plus startups and FTSE Fortune 100 100 giants. In our conversation, we talked about internal and external boards of directors, how to identify parts of your internal board of directors, and how to view imposter syndrome as a feature, not a bug. We talked about how you can take a user experience approach to your board of directors to listen to feedback and also lead with curiosity. Let's get started. Well, I want to welcome you to the You Belong in the C-Suite podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks very much for having me, Laura. Yeah, it's exciting to be connected with you. And I'm really excited for the audience to hear more about you. So can we start there? Can you tell us more about yourself? Yeah, of course. No problem. So uh, I'm a coach stroke consultant, I guess. I, I tend to work mostly in the tech sector. I have done for most of my life worked in the tech sector. I was once an elementary school teacher many years ago. In fact, I actually studied and started studied neuroscience and so neuropsychology was initially what I did. And you know, I think like many of you listeners here, I kind of post university, post college, didn't quite know what to do with my life. So I thought, oh, you know, I'll teach for a little while. And that was great fun. And then about 2004, I decided to retrain and I, I retrained in kind of this quite focused element in design, which was designing for tech, really. So designing for normal people. And I kind of started that 2004, did that for about 10 years. And then in about 2000, I worked for like eBay and lots of large tech companies kind of on that big wave of growth where many of them were growing on lots of kind of high profile 
projects and initiatives for people like Marriott and Disney and um, some big UK companies as well. So you might have guessed from my accent, I'm from the UK. And then um, in about 2015, I went independent as a consultant initially, kind of advising tech companies um, on being more customer focused and growth and got extremely frustrated that the C-suite was seemingly making bad decisions all of the time. In fact, that's been a whole thread throughout my career is people up high making seemingly ludicrous and crazy decisions. And I didn't really understand why. And so in about 2015, I made the choice to try and figure out why and to work with the people at the top. So these days I coach CEOs, mostly in the tech sector, but what's increasingly happening is I work with CEOs who are from more traditional kind of bricks and mortar businesses, because many of them are heavily tech focused these days, especially with kind of COVID-19 and lockdown, many traditional kind of you know DIY um, construction businesses, all of those sorts of businesses, they, they, they shifted online and they are increasingly tech businesses without them realizing. And many of those folks in the C-suite are struggling to keep up. So I kind of work as both an advisor and a coach to them to help them make better choices when it comes to running their businesses. I love that. Thank you so much for the added context. I deeply resonate with this idea of, you know, looking up and seeing like, why are these decisions being made and how do they not see it? (laughs) And, And how can we coach and guide? And so what were some of those things that you were seeing the C-suite making some of these decisions? Yeah, it's interesting. It's kind of relevant at the moment, actually, because I'm having a lot of kind of quite frantic calls at the moment with a lot of folks because of the, you know, the the seeming looming recession and especially the tech sector. They seem to be more nervous than many other sectors at the moment, which is unusual. You know, back in 2008, it wasn't like that, but the tech sector seems to be worried. And so what's happening at the moment there is a lot of the CEOs I work with, they, they're, they're displaying fear and a lot of their choices are becoming related to that. So when you kind of get into that element of making choices by fear, you tend to do things like constrict and make poor choices. So what's happening at the moment is is talk of redundancies and cost cutting and that kind of stuff, which is fairly unheard of in the tech space, but you know, generally for many of the smaller, bu- newer businesses that I work with. But it's a kind of classic knee-jerk reaction. Oh, recession's coming, better tighten our belts. Let's make some, you know, let's cut. 10, 5, 10, 20% of the staff without really truly understanding if that's the right thing to do. So yeah, making choices through fear or just because somebody else is doing it, oh, our competitors done it, we should do it. And again, neither of those are good choices or good reasons for a choice. But often when you really get into the mind of a CEO, that's often what drives some of their choices is, is fear or seeing what the competition are doing, which are never good places to start from. Yeah, how do your, um, your background as a designer, how does that impact how you coach these C-suite leaders? That's a good question. I My wife calls it. She says, so you, you seem to work with these people and they just dump their brain on you and then you help them make sense of that. And I think being a visual thinker helps me do that. So I'm very used to kind of making complex, challenging problems and issues. So I don't know what work with like, you know, booking hotels online or buying complicated things or doing a tax return online or buying a train ticket online. That's where a lot of my design skills we're working on and it's it's a similar thing where there's seemingly quite complex problems that people can't make sense of and i help see clarity through those problems really because that's definitely been one of my superpowers up to this point in my career definitely i really like how you've articulated that and how you can help them solve problems um i also want to talk to you today about another topic you talk about sometimes which is this idea of um, internal and external board of directors and so I'd love to pick your brain about it, especially our yeah, listeners are, are really thinking about, you know, career advancement, how they can also be and show up as leaders for their teams. And so can we, can we first just kind of level set, like what is internal and what is external board of directors? Yeah, let's talk about this. Let's start with the external board. You know, a board of directors, companies have board of directors. And because primarily I work with CEOs, here's a secret. Most CEOs do not like having to manage and deal with their external board of directors they don't enjoy the experience because it's scrutiny that's the end of the day that's really what they're what's going on there and so they often dread it and like the rest of us they procrastinate about preparing for it under prepare over prepare all of those things that all of us do happens when you when a ceo has to manage their board and often that means that those board situations go as badly as they're expecting them to to go because they're not being up there and not being authentic in front of that board because they're worried about it. And 
the same is often true of our internal board because again an external board of directors for a ceo is there is there is what's holding them to account and similarly we have a you know they'll tell a ceo you're not doing a very good job and many of you may recognize you know you're not doing a very good job is something that perhaps your internal board of directors is telling you so i used to do a lot of public speaking a lot of public speaking and i used to get very scared of it and you know they, and i was torn because i on the one hand had this kind of imposter syndrome where i was like i'm going on stage what what all these really interesting smart people what what could i possibly tell them that they don't already know you know my mm -hmm. imposter syndrome was there you know telling me that i wasn't going to do a good enough job and you know that i i actually ended up calling my imposter i gave it a name my imposter's imp which is a part of me and what's interesting about imp is imp was always telling me you know i wasn't worthy i i didn't deserve to be there all of those things that i'm sure many of you many of you listening hear and understand but then at the same time i was conflicted because i really enjoyed speaking i loved that feeling of that rush of coming off the stage and people being wow that was amazing that adulation and that really opened my eyes a bit i was thinking well how can i have these two conflicting feelings about seeming, seeming the same thing you know on the one hand i love it on the one hand i don't feel like i should be doing it and again similarly the same is true in your external board of directors you have your fans you have your detractors on your board of directors and the same is true of your internal board of directors and once i started seeing my internal board of directors as a group of individual parts it helped me understand how i could manage them a bit better really I love that. So if we think about external board of directors is literally the external people that sit on a board, or maybe if you're not in that seat, it's a stakeholder group or something. And then your internal board of directors is literally the stories that are, are kind of yeah. replaying in your mind. Is that right? That's right. That's exactly yeah. right. They're rattling around in your head. They're the voices in your head that are telling you to do things. Now, you know, you can put those voices down to being a little bit crazy. And so you often people will tell you to banish the voices or don't listen to the voices or you know somehow you need to conquer your fears all of these things about beating and defeating and stuff like that and if you play that into an external board of directors if you've got a, a director on your board who's seemingly difficult well you can't ignore them you can't squash them you can't do the same thing for them because again you tell me to do that to a real human being especially somebody with a lot of power on the board of directors you tell them to shut up and you're not going to listen to them what do they end up doing they end up talking louder and shouting louder and causing you real problems and the same is exactly the same is true for your internal board of directors if you try and squash your imposter syndrome it's just going to come back and shout at you at 3 a.m in the morning you know or it's going to come back and it's not it's not something you can just shut up and again that the similarity between both of those two things was initially when i came across this idea was really fascinating to me yeah uh, i am um, have you thought about this idea of the UX principles, the user experience principles, and how that kind of interplays between internal and external board of directors. That's an interesting way to think about it, really. Yeah, because again, that's my background is user experience design. That's really where I trained and where I came from. And what's interesting about that is that design principles are ways of, of organizing seemingly chaos. And any time you try to put organized chaos, often it can go quite well for you if you've got a structured, well-meaning set of, you know, assets or buttons or elements on a screen but the reality is, is people are far more complicated than that you can't manage people by principles alone you have to listen to what people have to say to you listen and take it on board and what's interesting about the theory that i'm talking about here and it's based on psychological theory by the way this is not just something i've come up with this is based on a a, a huge series of work that's been done um called internal family systems within psychology where these these internal members of our family or board of directors exist and they are they've been proven to be there you should always listen to them that's the key to this is you listen to your imposter syndrome because they're probably telling you perhaps a little bit of truth so mine and my experiences of speaking at a conference is the only time i didn't have imposter syndrome i thought oh, i find i've got this i was there with some extremely experienced speakers they all seem to be so cool and calm i thought oh this is fine i don't need to worry about this i've got this my imposter syndrome was gone and i got up on stage and do you know what i was terrible i stuttered my lines i was underprepared I just didn't feel ready. And what I realized is my imposter syndrome was again, one of my superpowers. Actually, it was a feature and not a bug. My imposter syndrome is that it helped me to be better, a better public speaker. Cause I prepared more. Mm. I, I listened to what my imposter was telling me, Oh, you know, they're not going to understand that thing. And you should maybe do some more work on that. And I was listening to a certain extent to my imposter syndrome, which helped me be better at what I was doing. So, such an important lesson for me that you listen to your board of directors internally and externally because they are competent and often they're the they're the parts of you that have got you through certain difficult challenging times they're the parts of you that can actually continue to help you in the future so 
all of these different parts within me I listen to, thank them very much, understand where they're coming from and decide if I'm going to act on it or not. Again, in the same way you'd work with an external board of directors. Yeah, it feels very intentional, this idea of listening and then designing the best way forward, which then brings me back to the the kind of user experience, like in a traditional user experience method, like you sometimes think that you know, but you don't really know until mm -hmm. you actually talk to people and listen, like what do they really need? That's such a nice way to think about it, is that design alongside the customers and users who are using your product is going to be better than just one smart person trying to do it on their own. And that's exactly the same is true of your internal board. It's never just you. You've got to listen to all of your parts. No, I love that analogy. That's a really nice way to think about it. And again, you think about an external board of directors, that's exactly their point. Your board of directors for any company has to be well balanced with lots of different views and different inputs to help that company be successful and you, you yourself are no different. So I encourage you all to listen listen out, try and identify your internal board of directors and understand who's talking to you at any one time, who's the one who's whispering in your ear. And I think I've, I've identified around about 12 people on my board of directors, which is really fascinating. And who's talking at certain times can really help me understand why I'm feeling a certain way. You know, if I'm feeling fearful of a recession, well, there's a part of me that does worry about caring for my family and providing for my family. And there's another part of me that says things, well, if I only made 10 million dollars then i'd be able to forget all this and retire and it's that part of me that's really worried about and trying to achieve a huge monetary gain in my life because after i get that monetary gain everything's going to be fine which again maybe is a common one that maybe some of you have who are listening that i certainly hear that from a lot of the people i work with as i hit a certain monetary value in my life and everything's going to be fine after it preview it's not like that that actually you listen for what's going on there why is that voice why is that part telling you that What's wrong with your life that that part tells you that money's going to solve it? What is it that you need to actually work on? And questioning and interrogating and talking to these voices can really help you understand, well, why am I feeling like this? You know, and understanding and making better choices based on a combination of all of these internal parts to help you really make, you know, more, more of an informed, better, more coherent, clear decision. The world is getting more and more complex, and a bit chaotic. Pandemic, social unrest, recession, hybrid workforce, you name it, it is here. And it's hard to navigate home and work for yourself and for your team. And what about time for you? It seems non-existent. Our recent podcast listener and reader told me the following. This has been a light bulb moment, knowing my values and then identifying boundaries to protect my values and building systems to support those boundaries. It's been incredible. When I've broken one of those boundaries, remembering my values has kept me focused. In Values First, this book can give you the tools to build those boundaries, but more importantly, how to keep them with a proven framework to identify what matters most to you and the motivation to build a sustainable plan. Values First, How Knowing Your Core Beliefs Can Get You the Life and Career You Want is now available wherever books are sold. Go to thecatchgroup.com slash values first to learn more and stay connected. That's thecatchgroup.com slash values first. I really like this idea of listening to all parts. Um, what happens when with a external board or internal board either there's gonna there's sometimes conflict between the voices right mm -hmm. how how do you decide and prioritize which voice to listen to the most well i mean that's what you're good at as a human that's exactly it and you the first thing to realize with your internal board is that there is going to be conflict there's gonna be two parts of you telling you either opposite things and that's normal that's nothing unusual for any human being you've got to accept that happens is number one and then you've just got to understand the merits of each part and where that part has perhaps come from. So I work again a lot with tech startup founders and many of them come from a tech coding programming background. And when life gets difficult for them, they go and code, right? And that's fine if you, you know, you're working as a coder or you've got a business of five people, fine. If you've got a business of 2000 people and you're the CEO and when things get difficult, you go and code part of the product, that's not good for anybody because nobody's going to tell you to stop coding because you're the CEO. Your coding's probably not going to be as good as many of your team. You're going to code something weird 
but it's a safe place for you. And you've got to understand well, why, what's that, why is that part telling you to do that? And that's probably come from a point or in your past where something challenging has happened to you and you've gone for safety where coding is, you know, that's for me, that's what I go to bed. When things get difficult in my life, I'm like, tomorrow I'm just like six o'clock, I'm going to go to bed. Life's hard. I'm going to do that. That's my, my manager that's helps me cope. And all of us have got these different types of parts. One of them is a manager and these managers look after us. And that could be, you go and do some frantic coding work or you go and, you know, other CEOs might just work 12 hours because they're really worried about something because they feel the more work they do, they're going to come up with the answer. Right. These, these parts have, have been successful for you in the past. And that's what you've got to ask them. Well, you know, you've been successful in the past, but this is a different situation from that. Are you helping me now? Is this the right choice for me to go ahead and do this kind of thing? Yeah. And often what we did in the past, right, is probably not what's going to get us through at this level. You know, and you know that to be right. And, you know, this podcast is about becoming or joining the C-suite is the superpowers that got you to where you are now, if you're at VP level and not the superpowers that are going to get you to be, get you into the C-suite. And equally, when you're in the C-suite, they're not going to be the same things that are going to keep you there. You know, it's a cliche, but you've really got to understand what that means. And that comes down to these parts. Some of these parts have got you there, but they're not the parts that are going to help you succeed. They're really not. You've got to make level headed decisions. And by that, you've got to listen to all of your parts and make a, a choice based on what everybody's telling you. You can't just go with a knee jerk reaction, which is one of your parts telling you something before. Yeah. What do you see? Um, and I know this is going to be different for, you know, each person is, uh, learns differently, but are there themes that you've seen for those who are evolving um, and listening more than others? Um, and what are those people doing? Yeah. So the, the big thing I like to talk about is, is early on in your career, you, you, you are very successful because you have all the you learn to have all the right answers to to what's going on. That's how you do it. You become knowledgeable on something. You become an expert on something that drives your career forward. All right. So there'll be a part of you that's an expert, like a an industry expert, uh, an HR expert. You know, you've got some extreme expertise in a particular field and that can drive you really far forward in your career. And that part can really help you by being the expert. One of the big things that holds CEO people and people at the C-suite back is they think they need to be the expert. And the reality is, is at that point in the C-suite, you need to be hiring experts who are smarter than you and asking them the right questions. And so where you've previously been having built your career on having all the right answers, when you get to the C-suite, you've got to then build your career on having all the right questions to ask everybody around you because you can't do all of the jobs. You can't be the expert on everything because you either become a bottleneck or the reality is, is your thinking is not up to date with people who are younger, smarter, or, you know, there's a team of 50 people doing the thing you'd once did on your own. So it's definitely about having the right questions when you hit the C-suite, not all of the right answers. And a lot of executives, most, and I'm going to be honest about here, mostly men in this world are much more like that. And that's why, again, diversity in terms of gender, number one, at the very least, at the C-suite level is much better because women are far better asking questions and not acting like the expert than men are. I know, very broad brush, but true. Do you find, I know you work with a lot of founders in tech, do you find the kind of founder CEO is in a different spot than a, a, a person who did not, who was not a founder, who has come up from different companies? Um, this idea of asking questions, is that harder for them? Oh, I mean, completely. Absolutely. They are, founders make both the best and the worst CEOs. They make both the best and the worst COOs. They, anybody, once a founder's on the C-suite, if you ever come across them, and I don't know if any of you listeners have, they're either amazingly good or truly terrible at what they do. It's kind of really interesting because they don't often have that self-awareness of, of how good they are. And also equally, what often happens with many founders is that this is the first time they're doing that job. You know, they founded a business in their 20s, 30s, 40s. They've not had C-suite experience. They've not built up a career in the traditional way. They've sort of leapt the level, started their own business. So they don't have that level of experience of managing people. You know, they just right. don't have that. So often the most well-rounded, robust founder-led businesses have a mixture of both people who are career experienced and experts versus founders who bring vision, energy, insight, intelligence, smarts, imagination that founders are known for versus people who've got solid experience who've seen so many situations that those founders haven't seen before that's what makes a well-balanced founder-led organization 
And often what you see at the, the top level is a lot of founders like to hire other founders, especially on their board of directors, because they believe the belief is that that's where the insight is going to come from. The reality is it's not. It's going to be from experts who've built a career in HR or finance or anything like that, not people who've had an amazing journey as a founder before. Yeah, and it's really interesting that like you said the the thing that will propel them and accelerate them and give them the growth that they want for that company that they founded is almost the opposite, right, of how they built it. And so that shift feels feels big, like letting hiring experts and letting experts do that job, right? Yeah. And what's interesting is you, I see this a lot, is that, that founders will hire somebody who's just super experienced, you know, who's got 20 years, 30 years experience in an industry and then tell them what to do, right? That's the worst possible thing you can do to somebody like that. And again, from, from a startup point of view, that's what you do when you have junior employees, you tell them what to do. When you hire somebody 30 years experience, you do not you, you do not need to be telling them what to do. You, they need to be telling you what to do. I mean, it's what classically what Steve Jobs always said. He's the kind of typical tech founder is you don't hire smart people and tell them what to do. You hire smart people and they tell you what to do. That's exactly how it is. Switching off that part that's the visionary, that the, the founder has got to, you've got, that's got to take a back seat to the person that's the leader. And being a leader is not the same as being a founder. It's not the same as being a CEO. Those skills are different and different parts help you be a better leader than, you know, a, a founder who's got a business of five people trying to raise $20 million in VC funding. It's a very different set of skills and parts that you need to really push forward. For each of those different periods in your career. Yeah, as we as we talk about this role of leader, can we talk about that lens of as, as a leader? How can you enable your direct reports, your teams to have this lens of internal and external board of directors? Yeah, I mean it's a really nice way to think about it. Is I think what often you see with leaders in the C-suite is they have to seem to be kind of invulnerable, perfect. You know, they are amazing at what they do. And so if they're admitting that they've got voices in their head telling them to do things, you can't ever say in an organization, you can imagine how that would go down. People feel like, oh, my, you know, what was this company going to go? Shareholders are in, you know, it, it, it's a very challenging thing to do. At the very least to say you, you, you are vulnerable. You don't have all the answers all the time that you are like that. So number one is just understanding you're not perfect and being authentic means that that's exactly what authenticity means at that level is that you don't put on a perfect persona of you you come up there with your vulnerabilities on show right you know, for the world to see and people think that you've as a leader you've got to be invulnerable but actually what's interesting when you when you show your vulnerabilities other people do as well that opens up other people to show you vulnerabilities too and that can help you then understand why your team are doing certain things why your executive team are not getting on with each other because again they're trained not to be like that you know the classic mba training of an executive is not really what suits modern businesses at all especially post pandemic when home and family life has merged hugely with work life you can't be that you know chisel jawed white tooth executive anymore you can't be like that you've got to show vulnerability up there and that's what encourages vulnerability in everybody else yeah i couldn't agree more you have mentioned, you know, impacts of pandemic. Um, what do you think the kind of this idea of, you know, leadership, board of directors, as we, I've been seeing like, I mean, it's this endless battle of culture can be built here. Or can and we have to be in person mm -hmm. versus virtual with Tesla saying you have to be in the office now, like all of the things who's going to win <laughs> there. And what do you think um, the role of, of leader is to, to meet the needs of, of employees moving forward? I think it's a really important question, is that you look at how the C-suite has been trained over the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years. You look at Harvard Business Review. It's all about command and control structures. You know, you look at where a lot of modern, especially American businesses started from was coming out of the Second World War. You know, it was leaders in the army coming into business and assuming that that command and control structure was going to work. And that's where so many businesses of the kind of 1950s to where we are now, the businesses started by baby by the boomers. That's where they that was their secret power. It was command and control. There was a part, a part of that leader, a part was telling them, you've got to be in full control of this team. You've got to be on top of them all the time. And if you don't, they're going to get lazy and they're going to desert because that's what soldiers do. They'll, they'll mess around if you're not going to do that sort of stuff. So command and control has been inbuilt into business for 50 years at least. And obviously the, the pandemic did it was it upended that. You don't, you can't suddenly you can't walk 
you can't walk the halls, walk the offices and see that everybody's working away at their desk. You can't see that anymore. And for a lot of leaders, that was frightening because that was their command and control structure was watching people, monitoring people, all of those kinds of things to making sure they weren't messing around. They weren't having fun when they should be working, you know, and we know that that's not the case. And all of you listeners who were, who were working at home during the pandemic, you weren't slacking off. You know, you were working as hard as you had to work. You know, yeah, sure, it was great to be able to finish a meeting and quickly put the laundry, take the laundry off. That was just a real perk of it. But that didn't mean you were spending all day watching Netflix when you should have been working. None of us were doing that. No, we were working more. Yeah, we're working more. Exactly. And that's but 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 leaders didn't see that they couldn't look into your house and see that you weren't there watching Netflix. They assumed that you might you were again, commander control structures of uh, our old school business. And what's interesting working for tech businesses, obviously, is they, they tend to throw out old models. That's how they operate. And so they're not operating like that. You know, I'm many of the businesses I'm working for now are starting up and they're, they're going to be purely remote from now on in. And they're, they're embracing that. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, they're going to have success in the same way that businesses who are operating in traditional bricks and mortar are going to have successes, too. There's no right way of doing it. There's no winner. There's just now more than one way of doing it. And depending on who you want to hire, what business you've got, I mean, I can understand why Tesla worked like that. I mean, they're in manufacturing at the end of the day. Most of their team are building cars. So, of course, they're going to want people to be at work because that's what they do. They run a factory, you know, factory managers, again, commander control structures. The same thing. Of course, they're going to be like that. Businesses that aren't like that, a lot of the service businesses that many of us work for, like banks and software companies. No, it's not like that. You're not. We're none of us are working on production lines, churning out widgets where we need a supervisor to make sure we're keeping up productivity. We're not. Yeah, I, I love how you've described that that context of command and control and how that might still, it could be a model that still works in certain situations, but in general, we still do need to flex. And especially since we have now a proven, a proven case with pandemic. We do. Absolutely. We've got evidence there as well. And everybody's everybody's far better at working remotely. It was a crash course in all of us working remotely. And we know that we can mostly do it. You know, you look at the businesses that really struggled. They were related, obviously, to things that in the pandemic that were out of their control at like restaurants. I mean, if you work for a restaurant, you can't work from home all the time. I mean, that's ludicrous to think you could do that. Same with retail. You can't. But it's just it's just that understanding. There's just there isn't just one way of doing things. There are many ways of doing things. And you as a business leader have to figure out the right way of doing things for your business. You know, to, to keep the people you work with happy and productive, you've got to figure out the best method for that. And the best leaders don't, you know, another cliche, strong ideas weekly held. You've got a strong idea. My strong, my hypothesis is that people work better when they're face to face. My hypothesis is people work better when they're remote. My hypothesis is they, they work better when they're a combination of the two. Just do the, do the research, figure out which is the best one, go with that one. It's again, it's back to the same idea. You don't have to have the answer. You can experiment to find the answer. There's nothing wrong with that. Again, that shows vulnerability. I don't know, but let's run some experiments to find out what's the best thing for everybody. Let's try these things and see. Again, that's the strength of a leader is not having the answer, but knowing how to get the answer. A very different way of working to, I'm an expert. This is what I say you should do. Yeah, I really like that as opposed to this idea of cultures can only be built in person, um, even though we know that that's just not true <laughs> because of the last two true. years. It's not, you know, and it, what's interesting about those sorts of statements is you, if you is a, so if your boss tells you that, right, you can't say no, I disagree, cultures are built because you, you're never going to, you're never going to win if it becomes combative. You need to go in and say, well, I'm curious, what makes you think that? And do you know what? Almost certainly that boss who's telling you that they at some point in their career, they had huge success from closely monitoring a team they worked on, that their early success. And there's a part of them telling them that my that success is built on controlling your team. And almost certainly they had some success early in their career with that. And they believe that that's their superpower and they aren't open to anything else. They're not open to any other parts telling them what to do. They're not. So if you go in as curious to other people's parts and your own parts. I'm curious, what's my part telling me? I'm curious, why are you saying that? You can really unlock why somebody feels like that. And almost certainly it's because of a previous experience where it's worked very well for them. It doesn't mean it's gonna work again, but in their head, they think it does. Yeah, I, I like how you've um, you've described that, is to go in with curiosity, um, because at some point it was a payoff for them, right? Yeah. In some way, shape or form, and digging in with questions and curiosity might get you 
further insight. I don't know if it will get them to clarity, maybe. <laughs> But, it, but it's a start on their journey. It helps them mm -hmm. understand there are other ways, you know, and yeah. again, it's like you say to an executive in their 50s or 60s, what makes you think that? Well, they're like, well, early on in my career, I built my career by on smoking breaks. I was out smoking with the senior team and out on those smoking breaks. I built my career going forward. You know, that's how they believe careers are built. And that worked certainly 40 years ago, but we know that's not the case now in terms <laughs> yeah. of career building. But that again is is the thinking. That's how they've built themselves. That's the 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 story they tell themselves about their success. And you've just got to be curious about those stories to understand where that person's coming from, just to challenge it. Yeah. And it's interesting. It's almost as if you're with curiosity, you're tapping into somebody's internal board of directors a bit. Yeah, you really are. And what's interesting about that is curiosity. Curiosity is extremely childlike and nobody gets upset or angry about a child asking a curious question. Nobody gets upset about curiosity. Nobody gets affronted by it. It's not in any way aggressive in any way, shape or form. And that's the lovely thing about curiosity. It's a secret weapon to unlock incorrect choices, assumptions, views, parts, anything like that. It can be your secret weapon is curiosity as to what's going on and why somebody thinks some way. And Again, one of the biggest strengths of a leader is curiosity. And what's interesting, again, about parts theory, which is what I'm talking about, which is the internal board of directors, parts theory, is that curiosity sits at the center of that. If you're, all of your parts of you are silent and are happy, then you're naturally a curious person. You're naturally there. All of us have got that inside us. We're all naturally calm. We're all naturally confident. We're all, all of these things that we really aspire to be, like confidence and calm and curious. Once you listen to your parts and your parts of, you know, you've understand what they're saying and you've parked them, you, you get the clarity that you want. All of these, they call them the eight C's, all of these C's in the center of what you want to be, which are all of these things that you, you respect in other leaders. That's what happens when you listen to your parts is you can come back to those very natural human ways of being. And the, the start of that is always curiosity. I love that. I love that we're able to kind of peel back the onion on all these topics. And I just want to thank you so much for your time. Can you tell us how to connect with you? Yeah, please do. So um, find me on LinkedIn. I'm Joe Leach. That's J-O-E-L-W-E-C-H. The best place to go is my website, to be honest. I'm Mr. Joe, M-R-J-O-E dot U-K, Mr. Joe dot U-K. That's from my teaching days, by the way, I'm Mr. Joe, because nobody could, none of the kids could say my surname. So I was Mr. Joe as a teacher. So that's kind of carried on to my professional career. So M-R-J-O-E dot U-K, again, because I'm a Brit, is my website. I don't just work in the UK. I actually work more, more or less mostly in the US these days, although I'm based in the UK. So yeah, find me there. Find me on LinkedIn. On Twitter, I'm Mr. Joe, M-R-J-O-E as well. But yeah, just, just find me via Mr. Joe. That's the best way to find me, really. Wonderful. I love it. And then we'll put all of those also in the show notes. Joe, thank you so much for spending time with us here hey, today. Hey, no problem at all. Hey, I've got an ask of the audience, actually. Yeah, I'd love yeah. to hear from any of you out there. What, in this conversation, can you identify some of your parts? What are your parts that, that are out there? I've labeled some of mine. I've labeled my imposter syndrome. I've labeled my going to bed at 6 p.m. because I'm stressed about the world part, the worried about money part. I'd love to hear from some of you listening today what your parts are. So drop me an email. I'm Joe, J-O-E at MrJoe.uk. I would love to hear from you to hear what your what your parts are. I just want to know what they are and what they're telling you. So drop me a line. I'd love I to love hear from that. You. I love that um, point of action and challenge for the listeners. So thank you so much for leaving us with that. No and again, thank you so much for this um, space of shared connection and conversation. No, thank you, Laura. I've had a great time chatting to you. Thank you so much. I want to thank you so much for listening to the You Belong in the C-Suite podcast. If you are enjoying this content, please remember to rate and review on Apple Podcasts. By leaving a review, you are helping others find this content. We will be featuring five-star reviews on air in upcoming episodes. Editing and support for the podcast is done by S&E Podcast Management. To get more tips and tools to help you live a life guided by your values, go to thecatchgroup.com. Keep your boundaries and take care.